Hello, and welcome to the Servant Leadership Today podcast. I am Sam Shinta, and I'm joined as always by Rick Kite. Each episode, we talk to leaders from a variety of fields about leadership, character, the common good, and the importance of civic virtue. Hi, Rick. How are you doing today? Well, I'm I'm doing pretty good, though it's a, another cold, blustery day when it should be a perfect trout fishing season. Instead, I'm sitting here inside uh, working, and um, I, I, I'm glad we're at least talking about somebody who spends time outdoors because I haven't done much of it lately. Yeah, I think we'll live vicariously through our guest today because I know the, the weather has certainly taken a turn for the worst here in western Wisconsin recently, which is highly unfortunate. I thought we were in spring and, you know, there we go. We're back into November all of a sudden. We had, we had snow flurries today. Oh, I, we still do. I'm still looking out my window and seeing snow blustering out there right now and 50 mile an hour winds. Not, not a lot of fun. Well, hopefully our guest can take our minds off of some of this and, and take us to some exotic places around the globe. Uh, some of them quite cold, but still uh, still a lot of fun. Our guest today is Colby Brokefist. Colby is a professional guide who leads worldwide expeditions for some of the most acclaimed companies in adventure travel. He was inspired to pursue guiding as a career during a through hike of the Appalachian Trail in the summer of 2000. Since then, he has led hundreds of adventure travel departures, ranging from backpacking and trekking adventures to mountaineering and rock climbing trips, sea kayaking and sailing voyages, and wildlife safaris. His expeditions have taken him to destinations as far flung as Greenland, Antarctica, Africa, and Patagonia, as well as across the United States and Canada. Uh, in addition to field work, Colby assumes a variety of managerial, operational, and consulting roles within the adventure travel sphere. His work centers on guide training, guide team management, and itinerary development. He sits on the board of directors of the Polar Tourism Guides Association and is a certified senior polar guide through the same organization. He calls Boulder, Colorado his home. His first book, The Professional Guides Handbook, how to lead adventure travel trips and expeditions will be released this May. Welcome, Colby Brokefist. How are you doing today? Uh, th thank you, Sam and Rick. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm doing very well, actually. I'm doing well. I, I like hearing about the snow. You, it's, I, like, I like cold places. I was just at a hut trip last night, uh, and we went from Boulder up to 11,000 feet to a backcountry hut. And I skied out this morning with three or four inches of fresh powder, and here I am today. So I, I was really excited to see it all. Well, now you're making us jealous because all we're getting here is blustery snow and nothing on the ground. So mm -hmm. that's that. If you're going to have snow, you might as well have lots of nice fresh powder and up in the mountains. So which, uh, where, where were you in the mountains there? Oh, we were in the Indian Peaks Wilderness up above up above uh, Netherland. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, beautiful time of the year to be up there too. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And you were uh, recently uh, in the, the polar regions as well, weren't you? Yeah, I've, I've spent most of my winter uh, down in Antarctica. Uh, working oh, on fantastic. Box down there. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we'll probably want to hear a little bit about that as, as, uh, as the discussion goes on here. Uh, in your book, you have this wonderful quote that, that really stuck out to me. Great leaders often make their jobs seem easy. Unlocking your own potential requires a sturdy grasp of communication and management practices and a willingness to be flexible in your approach. Just as important, it demands a healthy appreciation of your own strengths and weaknesses. So how does this play into your, you know, your real world guiding? Uh, for example, when you're, when you're down in Antarctica, how do you have to measure some of these and, and you know, find your weaknesses and your strengths and also be flexible? Yeah, yeah. So sort of two different things to talk about. One, one would be flexibility and uh, adaptability. I think we can throw in there together. And, uh, you know, leadership in context of adventure tourism is a little bit different than some other arenas, because my role as the as the guide of the trip, the leader of the trip, is to help people achieve their own goals. So they're effectively telling me what they want, but then I need to then figure out how to do it, put all the pieces together uh, and make sure that it works. So every trip 
is different. And we show up with, uh, with some guidance, the itinerary, the people that show up on the group, or, you know, it's a, sometimes I guess it could be private people too, but they, they show up with something that's sort of on paper of a known. There's some objectives and some goals and we work from that. Um, but outside of that, on the ground, it's very flexible. How the people are feeling, what they want more of, what they want less of, uh, what the weather is doing, how to make the most out of, you know, tricky, tricky weather circumstances or logistical challenges, this sort of thing. And so, you know, that's, that's all part of the adventure, of course, of adventure tours. And that's, that's what's different from some other types of, uh, of tourism or leisurely activities is that there's these built in unknowns. Uh, and so it behooves a leader to be willing to be very flexible. And as soon as you start trying to stick a square peg in a round hole, you're just going to be met with frustration uh, instead of welcoming, you know, your guests to this place and appreciating what that place has to offer uh, and then finding ways to marry all that together to an incredible experience. So do you have a recent example of one of those, uh, you know, unknowns that quickly became known all of a sudden while you were while you yeah, were Yeah, I group? have to say this, this Antarctic season was particularly blustery. Um, I, I worked primarily on, um, on small yachts and sailboats. Uh, and at the, at the end of my season, the last month I was on a little sailboat. Uh, so the weather and the sea state really dictates what we can and can't do and the distances we can go and the timings and all of these things. So, uh, yeah, we, we mostly had to wake up every day and say, OK, here's where we are. Here's what we could possibly do. And, you know, just really just go up above deck and look around and, um, yeah, just to see what's happening and then make a plan from there. So we have strategies, right? You know, if we think about it now in terms of leadership and you have all these things coming at you that are, are unknowns, uh, how do you work through that and still maintain a semblance of leadership? Uh, and so we think about strategies in the adventure travel realm rather than having plans. Plans are like, hey, I know that I'm going to arrive on this day to this town and I'm going to get picked up by a transportation company brought to a hotel, those kind of things. But once we're out in the field and we're in the wilderness, um, you know, we have a strategy of, hey, we know what's important to everybody on the trip. We know what their goals and their interests are, their their abilities. And so then we can kind of build a framework for achieving those things. But how that actually works and when and where we plug and play all these pieces uh, just depends on the day. And that's where the, the strategic sort of planning comes in. And what would be an example of one of those strategies that you would use? Well, for instance, if, if we follow through on this, this example of being in the sailboat in poor, poor weather, I had folks that were really interested in kayaking. Uh, and they also wanted to visit some of the old historic whaling sites that were there. And so those two things are on my mind is, is you know, sort of wanting to prioritize for the people that, that are there. Um, the, the weather made that really tricky. And so when we were deciding where to position the boat, where our anchorages were going to be, we tried to set ourselves up in places where we had access to good kayaking areas and we had access to a couple of different historical sites, you know, within a reasonable distance, but that faced in different different cardinal directions. So if you had a wind really ripping in from one spot or if the swell was up on the beach and we couldn't do a landing, we could potentially go around the corner or to the other side of a particular island and then we could find something to do over there. So we could still accomplish people's goals. Uh, in the strategic planning part of it was then putting in, our, in, our, in, a, in a place where we had the ability to be flexible and we weren't stuck with this concrete plan that may or may not go as we envision. And I can imagine sometimes then you're, and, and, and I see this in companies as well, that you're going to have to deal with a bit of disappointment, right? Because you have this idea that people have an, uh, an objective, they have a sense of what they want to do or what they hope to see or achieve, but, uh, but the world is going to dictate otherwise. So how do you, how do you deal with that disappointment? Yeah, it's true. And, and those, those things happen, uh, of course. Uh, you know, we, have, we have stated ob objectives. And I think depending on what types of trips I'm leading or you know, what, what sort of realm of adventure travel you're working in, for instance, safaris, it's like, well, I might want to go see the elephants. Great. You can try all day long for every day to try to find an elephant. Sometimes you just can't. They're wild animals and they move around and they have minds of their own. Right. Uh, so those things you just have to hope for weather windows for summiting peaks, that sort of thing. Like you can set everything up for success, but you get, you know, real poor weather up there and it, it's dangerous and too risky. And then, and then you can't go to the summit that day. So those, those types of risks that are inherent to the experience are part of adventure travel. I like to say it's part of the charm and sometimes it don't, doesn't work out, but of course, 
in, in, in my view, being a professional, like we were setting up these itineraries and these, these trips and working with people in times where we think that we can best guarantee their success. So usually we're able to do that. Flip, flip that around a little bit. Now, the other, the other type of sort of risk that's out there is just risk from poor planning and poor execution, right? Not anticipating things, not being willing to be adaptable, uh, not paying attention to the, the guests, the, my clients, and what they want, what they're asking for, what their interests are, what they're capable of, uh, and then failing because we're not recognizing all the things that have happened situationally. So operational risks and, uh, you know, poor time management, these sort of things come down to people like me as the expeditions leader, where I really do have control over that stuff. And that's where the real management of the trips come in. Excellent. Um, you know, one of the other things that really strikes me about uh, having read your book and then watching this wonderful uh, video that the World Wildlife Fund put together uh, on you, uh, that's available on YouTube called The Guide, um, is your sense of environmental responsibility. Uh, that, that that ethic really runs through the work that you do. Uh, and so not only in terms of how you're preparing the trip, but how you communicate to the folks that come along with you. How do you, how do you get the guests to recognize the importance of the, the, the natural world, that the natural settings that you're, you're taking them to? Yeah. Uh, let, let me start here, Sam, because I've had this conversation a fair amount with people recently because of the film. And there's this idea floating around out there that you can sort of create this methodology whereby people are then just going to have these transformative experiences or these aha moments at the end. And you can just sort of do it to everyone. That's, that's not really true. And I think it's good to acknowledge that. And, you know, when we think of like conservation travel, maybe being more mission based than, uh, you know, just sort of hedonistic sort of travel, like I want to go climb, you know, a peak and just summit the peak and, and feel some success, right, that I, you know, that, that I earned and achieved. There, there are different types of experiences. But um, yeah, I, I think it just comes down to opening doors for people for calling attention to things that are maybe obvious, but they don't know to pay attention to them. They don't know that it's special uh, or things that are inobvious that they wouldn't notice on their own. And, and sometimes it's pointing out things or helping them experience something for themselves. And sometimes that's communicating things that you know, your knowledge base about this place, introducing them to people, um, creative outlets, like, uh, like artists, that sort of thing. And we can connect people in the field, depending on what the destination has to offer to all these things that help develop a sense of place, whereby then people through their experience and through their now newfound understandings of these places, then come to care about them. And then they become curious about, oh, well, what's happening with this piece of wildlife or with climate change or the fishery down in Antarctica and these sort of things. And then they want to know more about that. And then it's my, my job. I feel like it's my duty really taking people there to then be able to inform them or connect to them with the people or resources they need to then find more information to become stewards, advocates, or ambassadors of these places that they now care about. Do you ever encounter resistance? No, because I don't have a goal. I don't have a mission. It doesn't matter to me. People are coming, they're coming out for all sorts of reasons. And all I do is make that available to people who find interest in it. Um, and and that's, that's as far as it goes. And, and so, you know, the art of interpretation would then be just planting some seeds for people, bringing up interesting little bits, connecting them to what they're experiencing in that moment. Um, and they find that enjoyable and interesting. And then some people want to take it a further, you know, and then they, they develop their own curiosity and they start asking for more. They ask more questions, um, whatever, whatever, you know, I might do out in the field or somebody like me might do out in the field sort of provokes them to then want, want to know more because they're having these really powerful emotional experiences when they're out there. You know, and you mentioned that word interpretation, which I think a lot of folks aren't familiar with in, the, in this field. Do you do you see yourself as a as an interpreter of sorts, as uh, as a, just opposed to what people might think of as a guide, right? That you that that it's deeper than just someone who's taking a bunch of people to a place. Yeah, I think all the best guides out there are also interpreters. If we think of, you know, sort of all the skills that a guide brings to the table, interpretation is a big one, um, helping people to understand what's happening uh, in the places that they're visiting, um, finding ways to 
you know, determine where the interests and the abilities of the guest overlaps with what that destination has to offer and then making that experience as best as it can be. Um, and that's the real power of interpretation is communicating different things about this place that might, might be obvious or not to the, to the people, but then you can call special attention to it and put it on, you know, sort of in, in their conscious mind. Yeah, Colby, I, I'm wondering how you learned to be a guide because it, what you're describing, it's a real craft. And also that, and I would guess you've acquired enough expertise to really write um, for other guides, you know, how to, how to learn it. But how, how did you learn to do what you do yourself? I, I sort of fell into it, to be honest, Rick. I, so when I started guiding, uh, it was because I was leaving the environmental consulting business, uh, which was all sort of red tape and bureaucracy and not what I was in it for. I wanted to be outdoors. Uh, and then, then I started guiding and I was an avid rock climber and mountaineer and backpacker. And so I started working for a company, Southern Yosemite Mountain Guides out in California doing that. And it was great for me because I could be out in the outdoors. Uh, but what I found was because of my geologic and environmental science degree, which includes a lot of biology and natural history and, you know, all, all of this sort of stuff, um, I was able to talk ab about the things that people were seeing in a, in a way that was different than a lot of the other guides. And then I started being scheduled because of that on some of the longer trips, because I could sort of fill in the space, you know, at, at the campfires. And, you know, on day six, I still had something that I could talk about when we walked into a new area. And, and so I, that was it. I was just talking about these things because I, I found it fascinating and interesting and the people were in these places and, you know, whatever, you know, after day four, whatever is going on in their daily lives and at home and at work, like it, those things resolved, whatever was on their mind resolved without them, whether they liked it or not. And then they just start paying attention really to that place that they're in and really immersing into the experience. And then a lot of questions come up, right? Like, what is, what is this place? How come we were in this drainage yesterday and it looked this way? Now we're on this drainage on another, you know, it's facing another cardinal direction and everything's completely different. How, how come? And I could talk about those things. And so then I came to realize, uh, Rick, then the sort of the power of connecting people to these places and that they, they don't necessarily do it on their own. Even if they're curious, they don't know the answers to these things. Uh, and, and therefore, they, you can potentially, you know, as a visitor to a place, kind of hit a wall uh, where then there's no there's no more. You have these questions and you, they don't get answered. And and then that's just that. And you don't move on. But as a guide, I was able to answer those questions and then they could think about the next thing or it, it led to other ideas. Um, so then just over time, being out there with people and listening to what people were interested in and how these conversations went and then seeing the power of adventure tourism in terms of, you know, I had guests that got involved with wilderness scoping through the National Park Service. They started donating money to trail uh, organizations. Uh, I eventually started leading uh, wildlife trips as well. And those people donate to um, conservation charities to help protect wildlife and wildlife habitat and empower local communities. So that it was really inspiring to me to see that. And then that that's where I, started moving in the direction of my career so I could try to inspire more people towards stewardship. It sounds like you're, you're also, you're shaping people's perceptions by pointing out features and what to look at. You're changing what they see, what they notice, so that they become in a way more engaged with the landscape around them and, and then probably have more questions than they would otherwise. Yeah, I, I believe that's true. Although I have to say I'm a little bit guarded <laughs> when I hear things like I'm changing people's perceptions, I think just by virtue of travel, traveling with other people, we, we learn things from each other. So I'm one outlet that people learn from, you know, they learn from each other. They ask me questions. I've learned a great deal from my guests. And that's, that's the beauty of it. I think is that it, it just sparks these conversations. And then, so, you know, as, as, as their guide through these experiences, uh, it's my job to spark these conversations, but not necessarily drive them to where I think they need to go. Do you have any mentors that, that helped you along in the way to learn how to guide better? Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, go, going from just the dirt bag rock climber and backpacker, like into the professional world, I, I would have to 
uh, mostly thank my good friend Ian Elman, who, who was the owner of Southern Yosemite Mountain Guides that I spoke of earlier. Uh, and he was an incredible mentor uh, to me. Uh, and then uh, later, later on in my career, that I moved into um, a company called Natural Habitat Adventures. And, uh, you know, the guide roster uh, at Natural Habitat is uh, among some of the best in the world. Uh, and so even if people weren't actively mentoring me, which wasn't really the case, just working with these people and seeing how they relate to their guests and the sort of experiences that they were able to create for people out there was very inspiring. And uh, I turned to model a lot of their programming. Right. It, it, do you find yourself serving as a mentor to younger guides uh, getting into the field now? I, I do more, more and more. <laughs> I'm in my, my mid forties now, and I, I've, I've managed to make a career out of it, which isn't that easy, especially coming out of the rock climbing, you know, arena. Uh, so I feel really fortunate that way. And I, I've always strive to help other people, you know, that are, that are dedicated and serious and show the aptitude for it. Uh, and then, of course, now, as, as Sam mentioned, uh, I, I wrote the Professional Guides Handbook, which regardless of if I'm present in people's space or not, I hope that it can, it can reach more people and, and help them do the same. Well, I, um, I was skiing out on the West Coast earlier this winter with my son and met some of his friends. And it turned out one of them, she's in, in both graduate school and then she's also serving as a guide, especially in the summers, places out there. Um, and that's a lot of times what I think of when I hear about guides is that it's a it's a seasonal job, but not necessarily a career, not something that somebody sticks with for as long as you have. Is am I wrong about that? Is this something that there's a number of people that actually make a, a long term career out of guiding? Yeah, it, it comes down to matching up seasons, of course, and so you need a bit of a varied skill set uh, or a skill set that can carry through, you know, different different arenas. Uh, but I will say this, I think you're right in the U S um, guiding. Most people don't think like, Oh, that's a professional career, but you go to Europe, you go to New Zealand, you go to a lot of places in South America, uh, certainly Africa with the safari um, tourism. Uh, being a guide is, uh, is a big deal. People, people go to school to be guides uh, and uh, the guides are really revered. I just got back from Tanzania, actually, um, and did a week-long training out there with 30 guides. And we had people that were just getting into guiding uh, and just starting uh, in university programs and interning at lodges. And we had people that have been doing it for as long as I have, you know, 25 years or more. And it was really interesting to talk to those guys because the conversations and their trajectory is so different than what we experience here in, in the U.S., um, you know, they, they sometimes leave their, their towns or villages and their parents are like, my kid's going to go be a guide, you know, and, you know, and here it's like my kids dirt bagging it in a van down by the river, you know? <laughs> um, but I think more and more here in the U S like we have a lot of university programs now. There's some really great ones out there. Um, you know, university of California, Prescott university has always been great. Warren Wilson, um, Santa Cruz out in California, you know, there are a lot of big programs out there now uh, that, you know, carry the torch of professional guiding. Uh, and more and more we see uh, people coming out uh, from that trajectory as well. And then we have, you know, organizations like Outward Bound and uh, National Outdoor Leadership School here in the U.S. as well. And, and those are very, very much professional organizations. So I think more and more uh, people are recognizing that spending time in the outdoors is is just as valid as uh, spending time inside a cubicle. Um, and we just do different things. Do you have, do you have advice that you would give to some, a, a young person who is say has done some seasonal guiding, but then is interested in making it a career? What, what would you tell them to do? Yeah, I, I think a couple of things like what, one is to recognize that the, that guiding is all about customer service and, uh, you know, creating experiences for other people. And it's a wonderful environment to work in. It's still very much a work environment. Um, you know, and if you're, if you're getting into guiding, cause you want to go rafting more, you want to go backpacking more, like that's fine, but that comes secondary. That's just your office, right? It comes secondary to the work that you're going to do, uh, which is for the paying guests that are on the trip. So if people, you know, don't, don't really like working with other people and being flexible and adaptable towards other people's needs, uh, then you might find guiding challenging. 
And I think that's the biggest thing. The other thing that I, I usually say to folks that are interested in getting into it is, you know, guiding is all about what we call soft skill sets. Uh, so leadership and management and customer service, uh, decision making, these sort of things. Um, it's not about how much you know about a particular area or how hard you can rock climb or in a number of river descents that you've done. It's not about that. You, you know, I, I mean, I live here in Boulder, guys, like I, I can grab anybody off the street and they're going to be faster, fitter, more adept, you know, have more gear than I do in my garage. That's not going to make them a good guide. It's all of the soft skills. And so, New guides need to start thinking about that. And when they're talking about, uh, you know, their, their skill set to employers trying to get in, in the door, they need to concentrate on customer service and risk management and those sort of things to set them apart. I think some people might be surprised that here we are, we're a servant leadership podcast, but uh, we're, we're talking to somebody who's a guide. You're coming out with this, this book uh, for guides on a handbook. Um, but I think, Lots of times they wouldn't think of that as being uh, as, as leading to a, a very interesting or deep discussion on leadership. And yet, um, as soon as Sam mentioned that we were going to be talking to you, I thought, well, of course. I mean, that's that's actually what you're doing the whole time, right? The whole time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, you know, you might be managing, you know, one to 12 or 15 people at a time. There might be other operators, you know, some, some of the trips that I lead personally are logistically complex. Um, so I might be working with a bridge team on a yacht and the deckies and then the interior team, um, you know, and then, and then the guide team taking people on excursions, you know, that sort of thing. And so there's a lot of management and leadership that comes in. Uh, to well, how long have you been explicitly reflecting on leadership? Is that something that kind of happened gradually over the years? Or did, did you start thinking about right away as soon as you started guiding? Even earlier than that, um, Rick, I have to I have to tell you, like I, I came up in the Boy Scouts as as a youth and like it or not, leadership is forefront. You know, I think I was 12 or 13 years old and I was introduced to the mayor of my town and had to sit down on city council meetings and, you know, and, and all this stuff. And so, uh, you know, civic responsibility uh, was was a really important part of my life. Um, I ended up earning my Eagle Scout uh, badge. Uh, so then that came with a lot of volunteerism and service projects uh, within my local community. And, and I've carried that torch really like through, through my life. And I, I can't say that I was any good at leadership when I was young, uh, but it laid the foundation to understand what was happening and to pull lessons from as I got into, you know, new situations as, as I did get into guiding. Yeah. Well, this is a question that always comes up, you know, is somebody a, a natural born leader? Is it something that people learn? And it always seems to be both. I, I, I've talked to so many leaders who I, think of as exceptional leaders and and they give an answer very similar to yours they've been thinking about leadership from a young age oftentimes because of an organization they were involved in or people that they knew but um it, it seems to be something that there there's some people that have a, a kind of inquisitiveness about how that works and they and they start observing from an early age how others lead around them well, yes, I, I agree. Uh, but you, you use the word observing. And, and to me, that's the sort of the key to the whole thing, right? Uh, you know, not only to learn how to become a good leader by observing how other people do it, but observing the people around you and in your team. Uh, you know, that's the difference between leadership and management, right? Mm -hmm. uh, management, you know, managers can be very programmatic, and this is what we need to do and just do it. And it's, it's not inspiring. Uh, where leadership to me is inspiring. Uh, and it's not about how much I know or what I want to do or what I think is best. It's bringing up all the people around me to determine all of those things and then make it happen. And I'm just the facilitator of all that as the leader. And so observation ends up being the, the key in com conversations, of course, and then asking questions based on what you see, right? So is the customer always right? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Well, how do you how do you deal with difficult clients? I mean, I want to hear a story about one of your most difficult clients and and how do you how do you deal with that? Because that's that's a real test for leaders. Um, 
both in customer service, but when you're leading employees also, like, could, could you spend a lot of time on the problem cases, right? Um, yeah, it, it can be disproportionate. Um, at least it feels disproportionate, but you, you, caution does have to be taken to not get pulled to the squeaky wheel. You have a lot of other guests that are, you know, I, having a great time. I almost said compliant, which is a terrible, terrible word, but, uh, you know, they're, they're having a great time and they're on board with the program and everything's great and they deserve your attention. The person that's causing the problems uh, needs your attention, but at some point, if they're just continuing, you know, to be self-serving, uh, then then you need to refocus on all of the other people. So I think that's a good message for adventure travel leadership, right. anyway. Uh, but yeah, stories. Uh, you know, it's usually it's usually somebody signed up for a group trip, but really wants to make it their own. You know, like they have one particular need. Um, you know, whatever it might be, you can list off a lot of different things or the other thing, and this is what I've been running into more commonly with my, my work recently in the last few years, this big expedition style stuff is with risk management. Uh, and you know, the average person visiting a new area for the first time doesn't appreciate the risks involved in a lot of the things that we do and their whole, you know, their whole decision-making model is different than mine. And it can be really challenging to get them on board with something that's still safe and still good and fun and enjoyable and memorable um, without taking undue risks. And that that's probably the biggest challenge. We had a guy this year in Antarctica who refused to allow, we had a small guide team. So usually one of us would be um, a kayak guide and we would lead a group around and we're in icebergs, there's whales around, there are leopard seals, calving glacier fronts, right? And so it, it could be fun to kayak around in these places, uh, but it needs to be managed, um, you know, particularly. <laughs> Uh, and to the average person, you know, you look out and it's like, oh, all these icebergs are just floating around and I don't see any ice falling off the wall and there are no seals trying to, you know, eat me right now. Like, what's the problem? I just want to go, you know, as they get in the water and then it's just, psh, and they want to just starburst and just go sort of do their own thing. So this year we had somebody that, that wanted that really, really refused. And, but, you know, again, we can be flexible with the needs and we, we came up with a solution that worked uh, where I actually planted myself on the bridge where I'm, I'm two or three decks up, three decks up, I guess, and could see over most of the ice. And then I put the other guides uh, in safety zodiacs. And we basically ran a perimeter around there. And so if we saw, and they didn't want to be anywhere near us. So, cause there's some concern like, oh, well, you don't want to go over and then tell that person they can't do something because that's exactly the problem right now. Um, but they didn't want to be told what to do. So if we saw them sort of getting too close to something, that I would just call it in and the Zodiac would go over to that place and then they would avoid the staff member and therefore do what we wanted them to do. Uh, so, you know, a great example of a challenging guest, but in the end, they still got out there. They felt this sense of autonomy. Uh, we were flexible with the way that we usually run that program uh, and it, it was a success. Nobody got hurt and everybody had fun. But you, It sounds like you kept them safe even in in some ways against their will or against their inclination, you kept them safe, yeah. but without confrontation either. Yeah. I mean, they totally wanted to drown themselves under a flipping iceberg. Yeah. That's what, that's what they were trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I suspect Rick was hoping to hear a story about how you had to duct tape someone to the deck of the ship, you know, because they just were so non-compliant. It, it was close. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you talk, uh, Colby, about the environmental ethic that you and the stewardship lessons that you provide. But I know a big part of the job of, of doing a lot of these international trips is also cultural awareness and cultural responsibility. How, how do you prepare for that yourself uh, going to all different places? And then how do you convey that information to the to the folks that are with you? Yeah, thank, thanks for asking this question, because it is just as important, I think. Um, you know, we, we talked earlier about developing a sense of place and that the people, the communities, um, you know, just the situation, circumstances of the, of, of the local population are really, really important. Um, 
it can be tricky for me, to be honest, because my background is not in history and culture and humanities and that sort of thing. Uh, but I rely on um, I rely on learning history of the sort of explorers and, uh, you know, locals, governmental stuff, changes, stuff that you can read about where I'm not I don't feel like I'm appropriating anything culturally, but that I can communicate facts and storylines and timelines about an area um, and a group of people that live there. Past that, I really try to get other people involved. Um, you know, having local speakers come in, they can join us for part of the trip, or maybe we go visit them. Uh, like I lead trips in Yellowstone, they're photography trips in the wintertime for wildlife. But in the wintertime, you know, dusk is like four or four thirty, and then we don't have a lot to do. So then we bring in local speakers that come then and talk about their own local perspectives. Um, you know, for little programs after dinner, and people get to meet them. So there, there are a lot of ways uh, to do that. And you know, the the companies that I work for are very mindful of this. So again, some of it's built into the programming as well. You know, if we're, we're if we're using local lodges, we're using local, you know people just all throughout the trip and then so my job also becomes encouraging conversations between my guests and those local people what's it like to be you here in your place and to add perspective to things and then if i know my guests have had questions on things that i don't feel like i should have a voice on or don't have perspective on i can identify those people during the trip that might and then make those connections and sometimes it might be a waiter it might be our driver uh, or it could be some sort of luminary speaker that's like joining part of the trip as you know he's billed to be there yeah I, I remember when i was first talking with rick about having you on the podcast and we were talking about the environmental and cultural stuff and, and he, he made the observation that well colby in a sense is a teacher right that you are you are educating you're providing an educational or the interpretive service for these people and and obviously one of the great skills of any good teacher is also to know their limits and when to say Good question. I don't know, but let's find the answer. Uh, so I, I love that you, you know, you, you kind of recognize that you can provide that platform, but also that there are other people that can share in that interpretive uh, process. Yeah, it, it, you know, Rick, you're asking about advice for, you know, people coming into the industry. And th this is huge, right? As the guide, there's a lot of pressure on you. People will keep asking questions and they'll keep pushing. What I've learned is that they don't, they don't expect you to know everything. They expect you to share the things if you do know them. But at some point, you just say you don't know. That's okay because pe people don't expect you to know everything about everything. But then the magic is following through and saying, I don't know, but I can find out or I can introduce you to this person or whatever and still follow through for that person. And that's that's an exceptional guest experience. So there are there are a lot of resources available right now. And sometimes it's Google at dinner time, like, hey, let's look up your question. You know, it you know, and some sometimes it's it's it it's more. Yeah. You know, one of the other uh, observations you made in that uh, WWF uh, video, not World Wildlife Federation, <laughs> or, or not not World Wrestling Federation, World Wildlife Fund. World Wildlife, yeah. Uh, yeah, World Wildlife Fund video uh, is uh, the fact that. Uh, you are an introvert by your nature, and yet you are working in a field where you very much have to be an extrovert. How do you how do you pull that off? How does an introvert in 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 his own life become an extrovert, guiding dozens of people all over the place? Yeah, yeah, I, I do feel like I'm introverted in the sense of uh, you know I don't I don't draw energy from other people. I I very much give it. I feel exhausted after trips, uh, and so to me that's sort of what it means for me to be introverted. But it doesn't mean I want to go hide in a corner and not be with people. I really appreciate people. I've made a life out of traveling with people, and, and again learning and sharing from each other. Um, I don't have any problem when I have some expertise or something to say to contribute to the group that I'm traveling with. Uh, and then as a leader, again, like I, I'm inspired by them and their energy and what they want to do. And I'm putting in all the pieces to develop strategies and plans to make those things happen. So really it's, I'm, I'm facilitating these experiences for them rather than, you know, flying my flag and saying, I'm super charismatic and awesome. And you guys just want to be with me. That's, that's not what leadership is about for me. There are leaders that are like that. They're just fun to be around, you know, and people just follow them around and, you know, you can, 
you know, just these spontaneous motivators, right? Uh, but that's that's not me so much. Uh, I work. I like to work from behind. Well, and it's it, it almost is like, uh, and, and this is interesting. It's almost like you become invisible if you're doing it well, right? Because then people are focusing on the experience, not on you. Yes, yes. Although I have also learned, um, you know, in your your quote at the beginning, you pulled this out, Sam. Kind of relates to this, you know, of uh, you know, great leaders make it look easy. And what I what I have learned in a in an environment where I don't work with any of my managers, superiors directly. And so it's the guest evaluations that come in that tell my office how well I'm doing. And I, I also work in a tipping environment and a substantial portion of my pay is, on, is, is by gratuities. If I work too much in the background, in the shadows, and, and, and people aren't recognizing that I'm doing these things for them, then that all falls apart for me. So there is a fine line in there somewhere of sort of maintaining your leadership and taking some credit for things that are happening and letting people know, you know, for me, it's, it, it's outwardly communicating and recognizing, I know this is important to you. I can make this happen. This is how I'm going to make it happen. And then it does. And it's, it's, it's a, just a simple, usually little statement and, you know, touch on the shoulder of like, no problem, I'll do it, you know, and then they see it and I don't need to do anything more. Yeah, like when you're out on one of those those boats and a, a beautiful whale breaches and you said, yep, you had that had that scheduled. <laughs> <laughs> he he showed up on time. Some of that kind of stuff, but, you know, being in the right place at the right time, you know, and so, you well, know, and um, that experience. Yeah, I'm, I'm joking, of course. But yeah, no, having well, done no, enough I know, but... of it, you, you know where to where to look for that sort of stuff so that you can maximize the potential for that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if there are just a million surprises all over the place, it's like well, an amount of those aren't surprises, right? The, the guide and the team is putting you in the place where you have the highest probability of those things happening. And so another another aspect then of, of leadership is, is then proactively telling people like, this is my plan. I know this is happening. We're going to be in this bay today. It's incredible for whales. It's also going to be great for kayaking. I know those two things are important to you it, you know, you'll have more of a chance of success. And if we go over here where it's, there's not going to be any whales, the currents don't flow through that bay, you know, and then boom, there's whales. And they're like, whoa, yeah, there it is. You know, like you can't guarantee the whales, but they knew that you set them up for the best chance. Yeah. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of books on adventure travel. And I'm just curious if, if you like reading about adventure travel in your free time, or if that's, uh, like you want to take your mind and you, you, your private hobbies are entirely different. Yeah. Uh, so like little Colby years ago, <laughs> yep. ate up all of that. You can imagine. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. any, anything that had to do with adventure, you know, sea, land, mountains, safari, it didn't matter. I loved it. Uh, these days I tend to read more of it uh, to places that I'm traveling to. Uh, and, and then, you know, as a way of learning about exploration and adventure in those areas. Uh, but I just in my daily life, I tend to shy away from some of that stuff now for the reasons I think you're getting at. It's just, yeah, I need, I want to, I want to think about other things sometimes when I'm at home, just resting. Yeah. Yeah. But there are certainly inspiring <laughs> stories out there. And, you know, the documentary filmmaking and the adventure sports arena now mm -hmm. is just so exceptional. Like I'll be, I'll be the first person, you know, flapping a ticket to the Banff, you know, film festival to go see what everybody's up to. Yeah. Is there a, is there a particular documentary that you would recommend that I probably haven't watched that you think I should? Yes. Uh, and I'm going to look through, it's uh, about this. Uh, it might even be called river runner. Let me see here. I'm actually looking this up on Google as we're, as we're talking right now. Good. Uh, yeah, The River Runner. Uh, fantastic, fantastic film. Okay, great. I'm, I'm going to watch it tonight. Yeah. <laughs> take, take, us, take our minds more off of this crummy weather. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, along the same vein, uh, Colby, uh, this is a two-parter. Um, I'm curious as to the favorite place that you travel to with people, so where you guide, 
and then your favorite place to go to without people just by yourself or with your significant yeah. other? Yeah. Uh, fa favorites, Sam, are always tricky for me because there's, there's so much value in different places for different reasons. Um, I, I will say that as somebody like I'm, I'm in guiding because of the storytelling and connecting people with the human relationship to the living world, to nature, natural environment, Greenland. I lead trips up in Greenland and, um, my company, Natural Habitat Adventures, we have a base camp up there in Southeast Greenland, the most remote sort of part of, of Greenland that's inhabited. Um, and you get to talk with people there that are, you know, in, in their 50s, 60s, uh, anything older than that. And they grew up in sod houses moving around on the landscape. Uh, and they've since moved, you know, by virtue of sort of Denmark and colonialism uh, to these, these town centers now. But some of those people still live off the land. And so you get to hear this story of, of cultural change, but then that mirrors a story of climate change because they've seen their landscape there on the edge of the Arctic just melting away from under their feet. And it's changed the patterns of, uh, you know, all of their foods, you know, vegetation, as well as the wildlife that they would hunt. Uh, and it's really fascinating. And on these trips, we get to explore in you know a variety of ways, you know, hiking and kayaking and zodiac cruising, and uh, but then also just spending time drinking tea with some of these locals. Um, and so it's this really, really fascinating experience. And like this is a place where, like, our daily skill set from you know from America doesn't apply. Like it just it doesn't. Like you you wouldn't be able to make a go at it there. Um, and so just everything about it is fascinating and it really takes us away. I find from the things that we think that we know and understand and, and just turns it all around and you get to hear just, just how different things are and how much change is really occurring on our planet right now. So that's, that's a really special experience for me with guests, I think. Um, and then on my own, uh, my, my favorite experiences are, you know, just, just backpacking out to a lake with my, my partner, Sarah, and some of our friends and just hanging out, or we go out to the desert, out to Moab. It's not so far away for us for a, even a short weekend, um, you know, and just running around in the canyons and disappearing. And we try, we try to go to places that are, aren't on the map so much, uh, just be really, truly out in the wilderness. Well, you've, you've given us uh, lots of inspiration here today to get, to get out and see the world and to experience some of it. Uh, and, and I love that, you know, your favorite places for someone who's traveled all over the globe, your favorite places are just right in your own backyard, right? So sometimes we forget that, that some of the most beautiful landscape is, is uh, you know, a handful of hours away and, and ready for, for us to just go and get off the map uh, pretty quickly. I, I woke up in the morning in a backcountry hut with four new inches of snow. It's pretty great. Yeah, <laughs> pretty great. Well, Colby, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. This was a wonderful conversation, and we wish you luck with uh, the new book and with everything else that's going on. Where, where are you heading next with a, uh, with a tour group? Well, I, I, I'm happy to report that I have a few months off here. Uh, I am focusing right now on the book and marketing and enjoying that. And then uh, in July, I go out to Greenland. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, but guys, thank you very much for this opportunity. It's, it's been great. I really appreciate the thoughtfulness of your questions. And uh, yeah, please, please do keep in touch uh, to both of you. Rick, enjoy the, the film tonight. And uh, uh, Sam, I know, I know we'll be in touch. Excellent. Thank you so much, Colby. Okay. Take care.